Good afternoon, and thank you so much for having me here today and for the ni nice introduction by, uh, by Aldo. So, yeah, so today I want to talk a bit about a, a, a different number of approaches that we use at the Neuro Rehab Lab concerning the use of virtual reality for stroke rehabilitation. And we, we, here we have different approaches. So one big chunk of our work relates to the use of uh, VR for uh, upper limb motor rehabilitation. So our paradigms are typically very simple. So we try to focus a lot on lower cost technology, also to help on the deployability of the systems at the clinic, and also with the ultimate goal that this is our end goal, also to bring this technology to the home of, um, of, of patients. We also work with the brain-computer interfaces integrated with VR, so Sergi tomorrow in his, on his keynote will uh, address that uh, topic on more, the, more detail. We also have a number of approaches concerning the, the rehabilitation of cognitive deficits. So we, we came to realize, particularly, of course, I'm, I'm more familiar with the context that we use on rehabilitation here in, in Portugal and Madeira and also some experiences in Spain, that typically there's a large focus on more motor rehabilitation on the motor side, while the cognitive aspects tend to be disregarded. But this have a strong impact also on motor recovery. And I sh later in this talk, I will show you an example where we can see this interference between cognitive deficits and, uh, and uh, motor recovery. So we have a virtual reality environment that is, um, is a virtual city where the user has to do a number of tasks that resemble tasks that would be executed in the um, uh, in, in daily activities, uh, tasks like uh, going shopping, uh, memorizing the purchasing list, uh, retrieving money from the ATM to, to, to go, uh, go shopping and so on. And so basically we encompass training of memory, attention, executive functions, language and, uh, and so on and integrate it in a real world context to really optimize also and work on this, of this issue of uh, ecological validity. More recently, we have also been exploring the use of virtual reality scenarios for elderly fitness. So a large chunk of our work is related to uh, rehabilitation, but we are also starting to explore more recently, more at the prevention level, to, um, to prevent sedentary behavior in the elderly population. So we are in the context of, uh, of the HAHA project that uh, earlier Alexander also spoke about this. We are developing full immersive uh, VR scenarios, full body interactions, where you basically you see that we have different games to train arm strength, mobility, aerobic endurance, and uh, dual tasking and, and so on. So basically these are the, the two main lines of, the, of the research that we are um, conducting in our lab um, uh, nowadays. I already show, so, showed this slide in the morning, so I be, will be very fast about this. So just the two, one of our motivations, of course, is also this this trend that we see that the world population is aging, and as a natural consequence, we see that age-related diseases are tending to increase. Of course, that stroke has always been uh, one of the main uh, consequences of, uh, of adult uh, permanent disability, and while you would expect that probably the trend would, would decrease with more um, optimized medical care, now, with this effect of having uh, the aging of the population, what we see is that, in fact, what will happen is that we will see an increase in the incidence of strokes. So, as I said, we, have more, we will have more people with permanent cognitive and motor deficits, and we really need to think about new rehabilitation delivery models. And here we think that virtual reality technology, among others, can really have opportunity to make a difference and offer a diversity of, uh, of new approaches to support uh, current rehabilitation models. So many times when you think about virtual reality, probably many times it is associated more with entertainment technologies, games and so, but virtual reality has a number of interesting properties that we can explore to maximize recovery after, after stroke. So recovery after stroke mainly relies on cortical reorganization, to, uh, to, uh, to enhance recovery after a stroke. And here we can think about a number of networks that can play a role and that we can explore through virtual reality. For example, the case of the mirror neurons. So mirror neurons are neurons that are believed to be active during uh, 
execution of an action, but also just doing simple ob observation if you are not performing the action, just observing the action. So it's like uh, you have an internal recognition of this action and you have your motor area that will be activated like if you were performing that uh, action. And this has also been observed while observing virtual avatars. Okay? And also, it has a meaning that we also tend to feel ownership if, we, if you uh, control a virtual avatar that executes movements in accordance to your own uh, movements. So all these aspects can be explored to see how potentially we could enhance cortical activation in these, um, in these uh, paradigms. But there are a number of other advantages that also taking into account what our current clinical guidelines on what should, how should be an optical rehabilitation protocol that can also be explored with virtual reality. So we can, first we can have fully controlled environments. You can design an environment that is specifically designed for a particular participant with specific deficits and you can control all the events that happen in the environment to pursue or your goals on this, uh, on this treatment. Task-specific movement iteration, intensity of movement concerning the number of repetitions has been strongly correlated also with, uh, with the cortical re organization and recovery. And this is something that we can promote through, uh, through virtual reality. Of course, always having this taking into account the fact of being task-specific and not meaningless uh, movements. Then we can have minimally supervised intensive training, individualized training adapted to specific skills, and we can also work with feedback for reward and motivation. So we tend to have our scenarios on a context of a game-like scenarios also to promote this engagement with the game. And as I mentioned early, the potential for doing rehabilitation at the, at the home. So, of course, this is not just about developing virtual reality technology. So, and we try to be very systematic on the way that we follow the process of development and, and validation. So first we have to acknowledge that we have patients with multiple profiles with different characteristics and we tr try to think about tech, although we cannot cover the full scope of, uh, of, of profiles, to try to have technology that at least can work to a large, uh, a large subgroups of them. So this means that we also need to be able to capture significant or meaningful metrics that allow us to assess, let's say, the clinical state of, uh, of the patient. And this is also important because it also allows us to continuously monitor participants over time during their um, rehabilitation process. Then comes the time when we have to, okay, now I have to think about the virtual reality paradigm. And again, as I mentioned this morning, this is not just about developing any random scenario, but we really think about a hypothesis. Why should that specific scenario, those specific characteristics, be better than any other strategy. Then we also always take into account that it should be easy to use, require minimal supervision. We rely a lot on gamification to promote long-term engagement, so an interest on the technology. And then a very important aspect that we try to fulfill in, uh, in most of our systems, try to see, okay, identify the specific deficits or capabilities, the skill set of each user and try to adapt the task on real time to those specific uh, deficits. And then, of course, one of the most important stages is then that we always go to the clinic and see the impact of this technology in comparison to standard rehabilitation and then using clinical assessment scales uh, that are widely used in the clinic because we really need to talk the language that is used by clinicians concerning the recovery of this uh, uh, recovery metrics for, for stroke. So I'm going to show now a number of, of examples where we re really followed always the same uh, process. So one of the first systems I've been working on, uh, it was, I started this during my PhD, was the rehabilitation gaming system. And this is a, was a very, uh, a very simple system for the rehabilitation of the upper extremity. So it was very simple. So this was a virtual scenario you had a camera that was able to track uh, color markers on the elbow and, uh, and wrist of, uh, of the participants. There were data gloves that were, uh, allowed you to capture finger, uh, finger movement. And so basically then 
the movements of the user were captured in real time, and these movements were mapped onto virtual arms that would mimic the movements of the user in real time and the, uh, and the screen. And, this, and the game was very simple. Was it just a very, uh, there were flying spheres moving towards the user, and the user had to intercept those, uh, the, those spheres. So first thing that we need to understand, OK, uh, I mean, we, should, we needed to know what settings we would put to, to the participants. So we need to understand first to have a calibration procedure that allows us to detect and measure things like range of movement, reaction time, movement speed, just to have a starting point for the task for, uh, for, for the user. Then, of course, our end goal was, OK, I want to have this task. I want it to be adjusted to what the participant can do. And while the task seems particularly sim looks very simple. It was deliberately simple because we wanted to control, have the, the higher control possible about what you were manipulating in this scenario. Even, see we, even so, we had four different parameters. So we had uh, the number of spheres, the, the, the speed of the spheres moving towards the user, how far away they were, so how dispersed they would come in the, in the scenario, the interval between uh, be time interval between the spheres, and also the size. So we wanted to create a way of manipulating difficulty, manipulating these four parameters. But how, how would we change this? Was this about changing size? Was this about changing speed? So we needed uh, a, ve a very systematic way of doing uh, this. So what we did, I mean, we knew that performance was a function of, uh, of the speed, interval, range, and size. And we, we just uh, did a very simple model to try to have uh, a systematic way of adapting the difficulty to each user. Basically, we just uh, did some, uh, some sessions with uh, controls, uh, uh, healthy controls and stroke survivors, basically where we exposed them to random combinations of these parameters and saw how well they were doing what was the score in the performance of, uh, of, uh, of this task. Then we did just uh, came to, under to, to we just did a, a four-factor ANOVA to see what were the main effects and interaction effects. And this, in a way, I mean, I don't have to worry so much about the details, but allow us to, in a way, know, OK, we have difficulty that we know it's a function of different parameters. For instance, we, we came to see that the size of the spheres did not have a, contrib a significant contribution to the, to the impact, uh, to the difficulty of the task. And then we just uh, did a multiple regression to make this, co this, uh, this, uh, this coefficients. So in this way, this, we had a very simple and very systematic way to adapt the difficulty of training. So what would happen is that, uh, I mean, there we would uh, launch 10 spheres in, uh, in, in the game. Then we would see the performance of the user, meaning how successful reachings for spheres the user could do. If performance was above 70%, this would mean that the task tended to be easy. So we would increase difficulty, and the, increase the new difficulty level would be computed, taking into account that the model of I, that I just uh, explained. If the performance was below 50%, meaning it was being too hard, then we would decrease difficulty. Otherwise, the, the performance, the difficulty level will, would, would be the same. So this was just a way to have the task adapted to the, to the skill set of the user. And this, uh, this optimization uh, performance uh, uh, model was, adapt, uh, was done individually for both arms, so paratic and not paratic. And we use similar approaches in all our systems that we use in, uh, in the Neuro Rehab Lab. So we, uh, of course, we wanted to understand what would be the impact of such, uh, of such an approach for, uh, in, um, for the recovery of, uh, of stroke survivors. So we did a randomized control trial with 16 acute stroke survivors. So at the enrollment, they were on the first three weeks after stroke. And basically we, what we did, so we, they, the, the protocol consisted on having three weekly sessions of 20 minutes during 12 weeks, so three months. At that time, this was a very challenging study because of two reasons. One, because it being con was conducted on the acute stage of stroke, even nowadays, Strokes, most stroke studies, stroke rotation studies tend to be on chronic populations, but indeed acute patients are the, the ones that have the most interesting profile and where we have can make a better contribution. So this was a well, also very challenging on that sense because it's more difficult to recruit and also because it was a three months duration study uh, of using virtual reality. And then we had two conditions. So one group of participants were using the VR training that I just explained. 
And then we had another group that was doing the standard conventional rehabilitation. And the conditions were time matched. So they ha would have these sessions in addition to their standard uh, re rehabilitation uh, program. So we did assessment of, uh, of the clinical uh, c uh, skills of participants at, uh, at the baseline. Then uh, five weeks after treatment, at the end of treatment, meaning 12 weeks after starting. And then we did a follow-up 12, uh, 12 weeks later, so to see the, also the retention of, uh, of those gains. We used a number of, uh, of uh, well-known uh, clinical scales. So we use the Bartel Index. This is a more general measure of uh, independence and activities of daily living. We also use the Motricity Index for uh, muscle strength. Fugelmeier Assessment Test that gives you an idea of the motor and joint function and of, uh, of the paretic arm and also the Shadoki Arm and Hand Activity Inventory. So this is also an activities of daily living let task, but it's very interesting because it takes into account the exact contribution of the paretic arm. While in the Bartel index, you can score high even if you don't use your paretic arm at all. In the Shadoki, what is assessed, what is evaluated is to what extent your paretic arm contributes to a specific task. So this gives you a very objective uh, way to, to look at, um, at recovery in uh, ADLs. So what we saw, so what I'm showing you here is the, is the, is the improvement for the motricity index, Fugelmeier and Kahai. So basically these were the, the skills where we had more interesting results. So, so for baseline, week 5, week 12 and follow up. So pink is the virtual reality, so we're the RGS, while green was the, um, is the control group. And we, had, we saw an interesting result. So first what we, what we saw is that the improvements were faster in the virtual reality group. And you can see here that at the end of treatment, particularly for the Fugelmeier and for the Kahai, there was a significant difference in outcomes between uh, the standard rehabilitation and the virtual reality group. Although then, we lost this effect to follow up. But even so, this was very interesting because taking into account that uh, the rehabilitation process, recovery process and stroke tends to be very, very slow, we were very excited for seeing this effect of, let's say, a, a speeding up effect on the recovery process that we think should be further, uh, further explored. In a later study, we wanted to be a bit uh, understanding the, the impact of using different interfaces. Because this has, a, has been a struggle that we also have been facing a number of times in our technology and, and uh, pilots and studies with patients. What is the best technology, what is the best interface that I should use so that users can interact with the virtual environment? So we wanted to understand if having the same environment but different interface technology, if the results in recovery would be different. So to try to answer this question, we did a study where we used the, the RGS, so the same system that I just showed you in the first study. And so we had three conditions in the study. So the virtual environment was always the same. It was always the game catching, the sphere catching game. And then uh, we had the condition where it is the tradition RGS, so with the uh, with, uh, tr vision-based tracking. Then we used the second uh, condition where we used uh, a haptic interface. So basically what would change with respect to the, the to this baseline condition, let's call it like this, uh, is that here, Every time the user would do a successful interception of a sphere, he would have the feel this haptic feedback that would give you the sense of touching the, the, the sphere. So basically, you would have more multimodal uh, feedback. And then we also had the third condition where we used the passive exoskeleton just to remove the effect of gravity. In our systems, we typically work on a tabletop, and we all wanted to investigate what about if we just remove uh, the effect of gravity. So basically with this, uh, with this exoskeleton, you just remove the weight of the arms and the users are, can move more freely. So we had uh, 44 chronic stroke survivors split in these three, uh, three different groups. And this was a shorter time duration study, so it was four weeks, but it was more intensive. So it was five times per week during three minutes and these two different conditions. So what was, how was the assessment? So we did two baselines separated by one week. So one typical thing that happens in, uh, in, in, in chronic stroke is you assume that uh, 
patients are stabilized at a specific level of a uh, specific level of skill set, but because there are changes sometimes from time to time, so basically what we did, we did two baseline measures and did the average of both, and then we assessed at the end of intervention and did two follow-ups, four weeks after finishing, and then uh, 16 weeks uh, after, so it was 12 weeks after finishing the treatment. So we had used similar metrics that we used uh, in, in the previous study, but in addition, we also looked uh, at, uh, at specificity, when we also, because we also were working uh, uh, the, at the, at the, um, this the level, we also uh, use the nine-hole pack test that allows you to see uh, finger dexterity and the box and locks test for gross manual dexterity. So what I'm showing you here is the, the results for, uh, for uh, at the end of treatment. So here you have the RGS, the exoskeleton, and the haptic interface. And what I'm showing you here is the, is the, is the mean improvement. And uh, you can, and also, uh, so here what I'm showing this is the statistics, the p-value, when you compare this, uh, this uh, uh, score at the end of treatment with baseline, basically to see if there was a significant within subject uh, effect. So basically what you would see here, bold or in color, means that there was a significant effect. So what we can see immediately here is where we saw uh, a larger effect was for the RJS, traditional RGS and also for the haptic interface. And we had uh, less good results, let's say like this, at the exoskeleton. But I should, uh, uh, I should uh, refer that there were no significant between group differences. So where we saw an, uh, an effect was just uh, a significant uh, within, um, uh, within subject uh, effect. So this was very interesting because, okay, this, uh, with this we tended to conclude uh, that uh, even the l most simple configuration that requires less fancy technology, let's call it like this, is a good enough solution for um, uh, a strategy for, uh, to use for stroke rehabilitation. So I think in this sense, the results were interesting to us. I also very quickly show, show you the results uh, at follow-up. And at follow-up, what we saw, but in terms of retention, so exoskeleton, most of the effects were lost at follow-up, meaning that the improvements were lost, while the haptics interface were where you saw the highest retention of, uh, of, uh, of gains. Probably also because of this multi-modality of, um, of feedback that gives... I mean, you can see that you are touching a sphere, but you can also feel that you touch it. So it really increases also the, the validity of, uh, of the task. And we had intermediate, intermediate results for the RJS. So taking into account these results and a number of other pilot studies that we have been using, exploring different type of technology that we have, we came to realize, OK, keeping it simple and affordable is the best solution and is what has been worked always better for our patients. So nowadays, what we use in most of our studies is something very simple. This interface that has a, that has a pattern, and then we use camera-based tracking to detect the pattern, and then we can know where the, where the, the arm of the participant is. So it's really simple, reliable, it stabilizes hand, we saw that this works very well with participants. They, even if they have specificity, they can easily grasp uh, this, this structure. And it works, and it works very, very well in our case. You can see here an example of participants using, uh, doing a virtual reality task where they uh, use this uh, interface. So in the end, keeping it simple tends to work very, very well. Another thing that I wanted to discuss today is about the content. Because many times we do arbitrary decisions about what we will include in our virtual reality environment. So we might decide that we will have some moving clouds, now we'll have some birds singing, or we have some uh, music, some soundtrack during the, during the, 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 um, uh, during the experience. But all of these decisions that we make can have an impact. So when you see that our scenarios are very simple, they are on purpose like this, because we want to have the highest control on, uh, on what you put in our scenarios. In fact, we, we wanted to a bit explore a bit this further, and did a pilot study, a single session study, where we wanted to see, okay, 
Can, if we have the emotional content of different valence in our scenario, will this affect the performance in a specific task? So what we did, so we used the, um, what we call a cancellation test. So this is a virtual reality scenario. Again, there's a hand tracking. And uh, the task is very simple. So there, was, there were a number, a pool of pictures on the screen. And then there was always a target image that had to be found between a pool of distractors. And we had images of different valence. What does this mean? So we have images that were positive, what we call positive valence. We had negative images, could be sad images, okay, related to injuries and so on. And then we had what neutral images. So we used for this uh, the EAPS uh, database that is um, a standardized database of pictures that have been classified on valence. So, uh, and then we, d we, we used some range way to classify what would be positive, negative, and, um, and neutral. And then the task was very simple. The user had to find a specific target image on the pool of distractors, and then we were looking at what was the performance of the task depending on the valence of these images. So we did this pilot with uh, ten, 10 chronic stroke survivors versus a single session, and we used uh, repeated measures uh, design. So how was this working? So basically we would present uh, the image, then the user had to search the, 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 the image, and then we also, because uh, our population, the, uh, was, uh, we were using a Portuguese population, and this, the, um, the APS was validated for American population. We also asked them to rate the valence of a, of a specific image. And we did 56 repetitions per user. After that, we did, uh, we did some assessment measures. So basically, we used the more real cognitive assessment, that is a cognitive screening test, line bisection, and a toulouse pierron test. These are typical standard cancellation tasks and also the system impact scale to a, a bit characterize our users to know to what extent they felt that stroke had impacted their life. And also the geriatric depression scale, because we thought it would be interesting also to look if, uh, if there was uh, any traces of uh, depressive symptomatology in, uh, in participants. Later, we also did a recall test because we wanted to see, because there was some literature that indicates that recall us uh, remember, uh, remembering some events are strongly affected by the valence, the nature of those events. So we want also to look if this was also true for this type of, um, uh, of task. And very quickly, so what we observed, we saw, we saw indeed a difference. So what we see here is the percentage of correct trials in the cancellation task. So where uh, yellow is uh, for uh, images of neutral content, uh, green positive and, uh, and negative, and also the results for recall. So basically what we saw is that performance was decreased, was reduced every time we used negative stimuli. So basically, the participants typically could not re, um, were not able to remember exactly what was the image when the negative when the content was uh, was negative. And this was also observed in the case of uh, of, um, of false memories. So what happened is that users tended to memorize the meaning of what they saw on that negative image. So, they, they, so what it, basically what we would do, we would sh show them images, printed images, and ask them, did you see these images during the task? And we, many times they would identify images that were similar on the type of context, but they were not exactly the same images. So this was interesting, and he also thought that, OK, maybe um, type of interventions that can be uh, can rely on the use of the positive stimuli could be an interesting uh, interesting approach to uh, to to conduct. So finally, the last thing that I want to uh, to talk today is about uh, cognitive deficits. So many times, what we see, and this is true in the clinic also and also on many interventions that, uh, that we see on the use of different uh, technologies and also in the case of virtual reality, is that most approaches typically are for motor rehabilitation or for cognitive rehabilitation. But there's really increasing ev uh, evidence that you cannot really separate those as such because, I mean, us as human, behavior, uh, human beings, we we simultaneously are, do cognitive and motor tests. Nowadays, 
um, in performance of activities of daily living, we don't have this exclusive separation. Plus, there's an, there's, it has been observed that there's an interaction between both when we are working on developing uh, paradigms for, for rehabilitation uh, of, of, of stroke. So we really should explore this a bit further and try to have, okay, tasks that uh, really require both demands, cognitive and, uh, and, and motor. And that's not the only issue. Typically what we see in the virtual uh, rehabilitation area is that we tend to exclude participants that have higher levels of cognitive impairment. So you typically, your user typically is people that, a person that has not, not cognitive uh, deficit. So this means that our technology in the end is just applicable to a limited number of, uh, of, uh, of users. And we think we should try these technologies also to benefit participants with this type of, um, of deficit. So VR-based intervention should be inclusive and also adapted to, um, to users with different profiles. Okay? We also wanted to, uh, in the this, in this study, well, we take into account the results that we observed in the previous study of positive and negative balance. We also decided to explore a bit further, okay, some what would be the impact on the recovery if you uh, use a task that uses positive stimuli that are adapted to the personal um, preference of, uh, of, uh, of users? Would this have an effect of, uh, of recovery? So we had to decide to explore. So this is a very explorative study where we were a bit looking at uh, these different, uh, different aspects. So our setup was very similar to one that you, you just saw before. We were using the, the same interface for detect uh, um, arm movements on, on the surface of the table. The task was very similar. And the, 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 so the movements between the vertical arm and then the, the movements on the table were adjusted to the, to the skill set of the, of the user. So the task was very similar, although here there were some differences. So in this study, we were using um, in the cancellation task had two possible configurations. One more focused on training attention, so meaning finding target pictures in the pool of distractor. So you could see here the target images and the user had to then uh, uh, find them in the pool of distractors. And then this would increase in difficulty. So that to higher levels of difficulty, you had more elements, more uh, to... Um, um, more targets and, and so on. And then we had a memory, also a memory version, let's say trials based on memory, where you would see the, the, the target images and then you had to find them in the pool of, of distractors. The, in this case, the images, we were using also images from the APS, but then we also extended them with other images were images personalized to the preferences of users. So we would do an interview them, uh, uh, to them before the, they started the, the intervention, where they tried to see what they liked, pay, uh, countries that they went to uh, that they liked, and so basically then they would have images that related to their personal experiences. And the number, difficulty adjustment, as I, said, uh, I just mentioned. So we had a, um, an algorithm that allows us, based on the number of targets, distractors, time to solve the task and time for memorization, we would be then increasing the difficulty uh, of, uh, of the task. So this was a uh, feasibility study. So we involved uh, uh, 13 uh, subacute stroke patients. So they were, as, as, a, as an inclusion criteria, they should be in the first six months uh, uh, after stroke. On average, our participants were on the first two months after, after, after their stroke. So a subacute population still with potential to, to, uh, to recover after, after stroke. Their average mock, so more real cognitive assessment, is a screening uh, instrument that allows you to identify if, the, if a participant has cognitive deficit. So uh, it goes up to 30 when you have less than 26. It is an indicative of mild cognitive impairment. So you see that our participants were between 14 and 23, meaning that they had a substantial cognitive, uh, cognitive uh, deficit. So we did 12 sessions of 40 uh, minutes in a range that could go from four to six weeks because it also depended. Uh, so this was run the, in the hospital here in Funchal and depended also the, on the availability, on the schedules of the participants and their standard rehabilitation. And we had two conditions. So VR training, as I just explained, and then the conventional rehabilitation that they do at the, at the hospital. But 
both groups had traditional rehabilitation, but then even the control group had an additional session of 40 mi 45 minutes where the tasks that they were doing were standard rehabilitation tasks, but real dedicated to try to uh, train exactly the same competences that we were training with the virtual reality uh, scenario. Because I wanted a bit to further explore also this, uh, this, uh, this concept of personalization, just more from an exploratory perspective, for the virtual reality scenario, so first we also uh, asked participants if they had any specific preferences in music, and in alternating sessions, we would have their music of their choice in the, um, during, during the, the, the sessions. So uh, evaluation, we did the uh, baseline at the uh, end of treatment and then uh, four weeks after end of treatment to look at, uh, at retention of gains. Pr our primary outcome measures was the Fugelmeier assessment test, the Shadoki and the Monreal cognitive assessment that I just mentioned before. As secondary outcomes, we had the Bartel index uh, for spasticity modified dashboard scale, and the other one that I just mentioned, and we additionally had the BELS test. So the BELS test is a traditional cancellation test for visual scanning and auto identification of neglect that in a way resembles a type of task that we uh, were proposing in our virtual reality environment. So we also wanted to look at um, uh, any potential changes in this test. Additionally, we also wanted to look at the uh, at, uh, potential incidence of a depression, so we also uh, look at the geriatric depression scale of our um, participants, so the scores on uh, depressive symptomatology. So very quickly, first, uh, the effect of music. While this was a very preliminary result, and uh, just we could, this be, just be that we only could only do this for the, the group that uh, used virtual rehabilitation, but indeed it was interesting to see that uh, if we compare the performance here the performance is in terms of the score in the task, so the actual performance in the, in the virtual reality task. We see that the performance tended to, was significantly higher in the sessions with, uh, with music. Okay? The, it was a small difference, it was 40% higher, but even so we think this is an avenue of research that is, uh, that is uh, worth exploring and we are considering future protocols where we explore We'll explore further, further the impact of, um, of music on, uh, on, on recovery. On the results, so here we have the primary outcomes of Fugelmeier, Kahai, and Mocha for experimental group and for control at the baseline and, and follow up. So, what I'm showing you here is uh, the median values and the interquartile range. In a nutshell, so when you see bold, this means uh, a significant effect across the three. Time, uh, time evalua uh, evaluation points, where we can see that we saw a significant effect over time for the experimental for the CAHI and for the MOCA, and also in the control for the CAHI and the MOCA. So here we had uh, surprising uh, uh, results that uh, really made us think a bit about what are we observing here. So first, we saw that we had significant effect, as I said, in CAHI and MOCA. There were no between group differences. But what we were a bit surprised because being in an acute stage of stroke, the improvements were extremely modest. Okay, we have studies with chronic populations where we have a, a huger impact. So it is that we came to acknowledge that indeed there might be a strong interference, a strong influence of the cognitive deficit hampering the uh, motor recovery. So this is something that has to be further, further explored. And that's something that has been observed in other studies of our colleagues working in similar and similar paradigms have also observed this um, uh, when using uh, cognitive uh, motor rehabilitation tests. Could also be related because we have a dual task paradigm where well, they have to use the co have the cognitive task plus motor, and this could probably be uh, an overload for patients with this, uh, with this profile. So we need to really explore this a bit uh, further. And then very quickly on the secondary outcomes, there was not much here, just that the experimental group, we saw a significant effect uh, on the Bartel. So again, general activities of daily living, but only for the experimental group. So indeed, where we saw uh, a higher impact in the experimental group was in activities of daily, li uh, daily living, 
And so we think that probably this indeed this uh, combined cognitive motor approach that really tries to re resemble more what we actually would do in the standard ADLs could be uh, an interesting approach to, to explore, uh, explore further. Finally, we also wanted to understand a bit, okay, but where are these results coming from? What could be factors that potentially are having a, an effect in our results? So we tried to look a bit, uh, do a correlation analysis, but what we did is, okay, let's look at the score at baseline for the more relevant metrics, so Fugelmeier up extremity, Kahai, the Mocha, Bartel index, and JDS, and then we, saw, we looked at the improvement at end of treatment into the correlation to see if there was some uh, correlation between uh, the level of impairment at baseline and then the uh, outcome in a, specific, um, uh, in a specific scale. And the only result that we had, significant correlation, was uh, on the geriatric with um, and the, the correlation between the geriatric depression scale and the cognitive assessment in MOCA, meaning that uh, patients that had uh, higher depressive symptomatology did less well in, uh, in, the, in the Montreal cognitive assessment. So while our patients were not having severe depressive symptomatology, so the GDS goes up to 30, meaning that between 20 and 30 is severe depressive symptomatology, between uh, 10 and 20 is mild, our patients were between 5 and 20, so we had uh, some that uh, were uh, borderline to, uh, to, uh, to severe. This just means that we should not disregard also the effect of, uh, of depressive symptomatology. So probably we should think about, uh, we should also address depression so and then that uh, patients can benefit better from this uh, type of, uh, of approaches. And this is not only the case for virtual reality, but other type uh, of traditional or technology-based technology uh, based approaches. So as a general conclusion, and also this is a conclusion for this talk, but also what I've been experiencing over, over, over the time while working in this area. So first is that a close dialogue between uh, health practitioners, neuroscience and technologies is needed to really come across with tools that are effective to address the problem of, uh, of, uh, of, of rehabilitation and recovery after, after, after a stroke. Again, this is a, we already mentioned this, but our systems, we really are not concerned about developing products, but having systems that allow us to test specific hypotheses that uh, we have concerning that why a specific virtual reality scenario should be better than uh, traditional rehabilitation. Hypothesis need validation, so we need to go to the clinic and evaluate the effect in comparison with the standard rehabilitation. And then we believe that virtual rehabilitation approaches should take into account a number of aspects. We should try to do our best to have virtual reality environments that are automatically personalized and adapted to the challenges and, um, and to the skill set of individual users, okay? Meaning that we also have to consider participants with different profiles and have to think, okay, how can I adjust the task so that uh, participants can benefit the most from this, uh, from this um, technology, okay? Also the content, we should not disregard the effect of content. So really think very well, have informed decisions on what you should put on your, on your content, because as you see, all these decisions then can have uh, an impact on, uh, on, ours, uh, on, the, on uh, the recovery of, uh, of participants. And when possible, try to consider both motor and cognitive aspects, because both are closely related and these should uh, not be uh, disregarded. So finally, just a word of appreciation to some of our collaborators that make our work uh, possible. Also, we work with Carnegie Mellon University, um, Data Health System, uh, CMM, uh, uh, clinics in the mainland with whom we will work, um, University Pompeo Fabra, where I did originally worked with the Reputation Gaming System, the Percro Lab uh, in Italy, and also uh, hospital, uh, in hospitals in, uh, in Barcelona, where, where my earlier work was uh, first, uh, first tested. And this is our team. Thank you. And if, if you have any questions, just let me know.